Good afternoon, and, and I, as program chair, we are going to make a change, and we will not serve red wine and white wine in the morning, but mimosas and Bloody Marys may be. <laughs> uh, before I go through the formal introductions, I do want to um, salute our two speakers today, and through a round of applause, these two gentlemen have served our armed forces for many, many years. Uh, we won't count the years to give away their ages, but I think a round of applause for their service to, that, to our nation is due. <laughs> And of course, the unsung hero in the crowd is Kay Kolditz, who followed her husband through many interesting uh, assignments, and we welcome you as well. I will first introduce um, General Ivany, and then we will introduce um, Tom Kolditz, General Kolditz. Tom will then make some comments, and then following that introduction, we will have a fireside chat. You saw the fire here earlier, burning warm. Uh, Bob is someone who many of you know because in a relatively short period of time in it, during his years in Houston has seems to be everywhere, uh, in, terribly involved in the community, has been, I think we will all agree, a great asset to this community. And we salute you as you move into the next phase of your career, retiring this year as president of uh, St. Thomas University. So congratulations to a great term and I think your board would agree that the university is in a far more robust position than it is than it was when you arrived, so congratulations. Uh, Bob had a remarkable career in the Army. He achieved the rank of Major General, and in his last assignment, presided over one of the most prestigious institutions in the United States, the U.S. Army War College, where he served as Commandant. There, for three years, he instituted programs to develop the next generation of military and civilian leaders from the United States and 42 foreign countries to meet the challenges of cultural change, organizational transformation, and a drastically altered national security environment. He served there after a 34-year career in the Army. During that time, he had various commands as an armored cavalry officer leading soldiers in the United States, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as Vietnam, where he was wounded in action and decorated for valor. When not assigned to troop units, he assisted several nations in the transformation of their armed forces. Uh, he was the first senior military officer invited to Hungary, which is a very important point because he is of Hungarian background, and I know it was a great honor to his family to go back and help Hungary go through the democratization of their defense establishment. He also lived in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait with his family, advising military and civilian leaders on the modernization of their armed forces. One of his most exciting assignments, and I've heard him speak on the subject, and if we hopefully we'll get a few comments from him today, was serving as military aide to President Ronald Reagan. During those two years, he became a tremendous scholar of what made President Reagan a unique leader, and I hope you will share some of those comments today. Beyond all those positions, he also taught at West Point and was also one of the football coaches at West Point. Uh, he, had, he found time to write and authored a article called um, Soldiers and Legislators, A Common Mission, which received the General Eisenhower Award for Excellence in Military Writing. Lastly, he has a bachelor degree of, of um, uh, a BS degree from West Point, as well, as well as a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. And I will simply quote uh, uh, from one of his articles, which perfectly describes uh, General Ivany. He described in his article, uh, From Success to Significance, that both professors and military professionals have a calling to serve, and nothing describes Bob Ivany better than that statement. Welcome. <clears throat> About two years ago, I received a call from a friend of mine, a general schoolmaker, and he said, I can't tell you who he is, but I can tell you Houston will benefit greatly from a good friend of mine who's moving to Houston, but I can't tell you who it is. And a couple weeks later, arrived uh, Tom Kolditz, and he has been already a great addition to the city as well as to Rice University. Tom serves as the executive director of the John Doerr Institute for New Leaders at Rice University. Uh, as it was explained to me, and I hope I get this approximately right, the view at Rice and John Doerr in particular, the great venture capitalist, was that Rice graduates tremendous scholars, tremendous academics, but could do a little bit better graduating great leaders. So with Tom's help, Bryce will also graduate even greater leaders than they have in the past. 
Tom also has a remarkable military background. He is a retired Brigadier General and is titled Professor Emeritus at the U.S. Military Academy. He led the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership for 12 years, and in that role was responsible for teaching, research, and outreach activities and management, leader development science, psychology, and sociology. He has over 26 years in leadership roles uh, across four continents, and he has focused on leading organizations himself or providing the leadership for others to lead those same organizations. He served for two years as a leadership and human resources policy analyst at the Pentagon, and a year as a concept developer in the Center for Army Leadership, and was the founding director of the West Point Leadership Center. He is an internationally recognized expert on crisis leadership and leadership in extremist contexts, and all of you hopefully have received a copy of his book which deals exactly with this topic. <clears throat> he has published across a wide range of academic and leadership trade journals and serves on the editorial and advisory boards of several academic journals. He is a fellow in the American Psychological Association and is a member of the Academy of Management. What you don't know is he's also a skydiver and has coached the skydiving team at West Point. So we've got football and skydiving. I'll, I'll let you take which ones you want to practice this afternoon. Um, he was a senior instructor for the West Point Sport Parachute Team. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree, three master's degrees, and a PhD from the University of Missouri. Um, the fun fact, actually the remarkable fact, in addition to his personal accomplishments, uh, his oldest daughter, you don't mind my saying this, is one of the youngest heart transplant recipients in the history of the United States. And I think that is a remarkable story. And if, again, I hope you will just touch a little bit on that because hearing Tom talk about that personal side of his life, you realize he can be a great warrior and a great instructor, but there's a personal side to Tom which is really quite remarkable. So with all of that, I'd like to introduce Tom to the stage. Welcome. Great. Great. Well, it's a, it's a real honor to be here with this, with the, this audience and the amount of leadership uh, that this represents for, for our, our country and for the city of Houston. Um, and I think what I'm going to do tonight, uh, the plan was for me to, to speak about 15 minutes and then Bob's going to come up and we're going to have a, a little give and take and do some Q&A and so I'll stick to that. What I'm going to do with that 15 minutes is tell you just a story about why you got the book that's in your hand. Sort of how did that happen? And why is it important to you? Why is that significant to, to what you all do? Um, if you looked at the cover, it's a scary picture of this person jumping out the back of an airplane. Um, and the book is a lot about leadership in dangerous contexts. And I became interested in that when I went to the leadership department at West Point. I started there in the year 2000. I figured, why not go to West Point? It's not like we're in any wars or anything. And then, uh, and then the world changed pretty quickly. And one of the first things I realized was that we were graduating, you know, 21, 22-year-old young men and women, and within nine months, they were all in combat somewhere, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, somewhere else. And so I began to ask my faculty, what do we do to prepare them for leading in dangerous places or leading in, in crisis context? You know, they've got 30 or 40 of other people's kids with them. What do we do to make sure that they get that right? And I got that RCA dog look. You know, it was just kind of like, well, we don't, we don't really teach that. And I said, well, why not? They said, well, it's not really covered in the academic journals. We only teach evidence-based content. And I said, so, I mean, if we get some evidence, you'll teach it, right? I said, sure. So I basically said, get on the plane. And I put nine people into Iraq to study crisis leadership on the ground in combat conditions in 2003. Uh, one of them was wounded very lightly, thank goodness. Uh, I think I became the first department head at West Point to get a researcher wounded in combat. Um, but we came back with an amazing amount of data, and I'll tell you about, about the studies and, and, and the data. But the, but the bigger idea was that we weren't going to talk to people about something that we didn't have good evidence to support. And I'll tell you, in the field of leadership, there is so much junk out there and so many people that are willing to stand up in front of you and talk about what they think without ever having checked about what they're telling you. And I felt like the stakes were really far too high for these young men and women to just give them war stories and pat them on the bottom and send them out the door. So that's why, we, that's why this book came into being. That's why 
we did all this research and all this work. And I thought as I was doing it that it was really kind of a military thing, maybe police and firefighters, you know, that it would be sort of a niche thing. <clears throat> and I was about halfway done with it, and we had a visit with about 25 managing directors from one of the big banks in New York City. And they came up and they wanted to talk to us about leadership and, and find out what we were doing in the leadership department. So I told them, I said, look, I'm going to tell you about this book I'm writing and this research that we've done. And I think you'll find it interesting and kind of compelling, but this is not for you. This is about this is about life and death situations. And you know, you guys, you take money and you move it from one place to another and when it goes by, you take a little out. And, and it's not the same, you know, as leading, leading people on the ground in combat or, or on the side of a mountain or, or something else. I got about 20, <clears throat> 20 minutes into this presentation and one of the MDs raised his hand and he said, I don't think you understand what we do or the nature of our jobs. He said, you've never looked into the eyes of somebody that lost our firm hundreds of millions of dollars. And you know they're gonna leave the firm, they're not gonna be able to work in finance, they're gonna lose their house, they might lose their family, and I've had people in my organization commit suicide over business deals. He said, so don't tell us that this doesn't apply to us in the same way because a lot of what we do is like life and death. It's about people's livelihoods and it's about people's wealth, but it's, it's, it's bigger than just a job. And that really intrigued me. So I spent about the next 18 months talking to neuropsychologists, trying to get data on whether there's a difference in terms of the human response and the effect on leadership between someone who is afraid because of a physical threat and someone who is afraid for a th for th because of a threat to their livelihood or some other deeply held, um, deeply held value. And the answer that we came to after that 18 months of study is that there is no difference. There's no physical difference. If you're scared half to death because you think you just lost your family's future, the res what you need in a leader and, and, and what you're gonna, how, the way that you're going to react is very similar to the way you would react if you were running out of the back of an armored vehicle afraid for your life. I mean, you're looking for the same things in leaders. So I'm going to tell you what those things are. I'm going to tell you what we, we found. I'm going to clip through four studies here in about three minutes just to tell you what lengths we went to to get the data and to study this. But then I'm going to tell you what we found so that you can apply it in your own lives to the extent to which you think it matters. And I will tell you, I, I don't think it matters to you. I know it does. And one of the reasons I know it does is that we sent most of you, if not all of you, out a little survey asking you about your experience with crisis. The first question we asked you was, how many of you have been in a serious personal or professional crisis or both in the last two years? And in this room, that's 70% of the people in this room, 70%. And then we asked you right now, currently, are you in a personal or, or professional you know, serious crisis? And the answer to that is that one in three of you sitting in this room right now consider yourselves to be in a serious personal or professional crisis and you're managing it all day. And that's something you should not only think of when you look at your neighbors here in, in this, this hall, but it's no different in your organizations. When you're walking down the hall, looking at the people who work for you, between 30 and 50% of them are having to deal with some big family crisis or, or some kind of professional crisis. And it's easy for us as leaders to forget that. And it gives us a lot of power when we recognize it and when we, can, when we can talk to people understanding that they may be carrying a heck of a lot heavier a load than we think they are because they don't look like it on the outside necessarily, but they're dealing with elderly parents, they're dealing with devastating medical diagnoses, they're dealing with financial failure, they're dealing with all this kind of stuff. And so are you. And so, um, you know, it, it's ubiquitous. It happens to everybody. Um, so how do you gather data on something like this? How do you get smart so when you talk to people about crisis or you talk to people about leading in dangerous contexts, you're not just selling them some kind of snake oil? Well, we did as much data gathering as we could. The first study we did in Iraq 
We moved all over Iraq by helicopter and by a Mitsubishi SUV with an orange panel on the top of it. Um, we went down to a, to a car rental place in a Kuwait City hotel, signed all kinds of paperwork saying that under no circumstances would we ever take that into Iraq, and then drove straight into Iraq. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, we kind of made this little four-person deal where we said if we lose the if we lose the car, we're all going to chip in and pay for it. Um, so we, we talked, uh, did, did in-depth interviews in the combat zone during active combat with 175 people. Okay, it took us six weeks. We used 16 Sony tape recorders to do it. And the reason we used 16 was that there was so much dust in the air. It was 115 degrees. They would quit working before the batteries ran out. I don't think we ever had one where the batteries ran out. They would just quit. And so we gathered up all this data, we took it back to West Point and Yale, and we had it formally content analyzed by social scientists. So they would go through the text data and they would code it for themes that they didn't understand our hypotheses, but they would give us the quantitative data on what the major themes were. We also did a trust study in Mosul, uh, a really difficult place at, at, in 2003, lots of heavy fighting there. Then it got a little bit better, now it's really bad again. Uh, and we, we had a, a researcher there who David Petraeus personally requested because he'd worked for Petraeus before and he was a known quantity. And you can't say no to a two-star general in a combat zone, but when the guy was headed out the door, I said, bring us data. And so he did. He did a magnificent trust study. He got seven articles and a book out of it. Uh, so really definitive on trust in crisis. The third uh, we did was with this parachute team that I was coaching. Uh, I spent about, <clears throat> about 800 hours a year with this team. So add that up and you figure out the weeks and everything. I made more than 1,000 parachute jumps with them. And at the same time, I had a lot of access to the athletic department because of my rank and where I worked at the, at the academy. So we did a comparative study where we compared uh, the characteristics of the NCAA team sport captains with the 10 most experienced leaders on this parachute team. Kids who had more than 500 jumps, they had competed nationally, they were instructors for the younger cadets. So we could compare student leaders in a safe environment versus a dangerous one. And then the last study we did was a more typical leadership study, uh, talking to leaders, but these were all people who were routinely leading in dangerous places and none of them were in the military. So I talked to mountain climbing guides from the Exum School in Jackson Hole, Wyoming that take people up Everest and K2. I interviewed a woman who took HD video teams into the Indian Tiger Preserves and videotaped tigers on the ground. Uh, I interviewed the SWAT team chiefs from the New York and San Francisco offices of the FBI. I interviewed large formation skydiving organizers who would take seven to ten separate aircraft and put 400 people in the air simultaneously to come together in a big formation and then separate and try to find enough room to open those parachutes before somebody came through the top of one. So these people were always leading in dangerous places and I wanted to know how they were different. And as it turns out, when you take all of these studies and you pull them all together, you begin to analyze what all these people said, there were five things that were unique to leadership in crisis or dangerous places. But, you know, we have found that this works very well for, for any kind of serious crisis, personal or professional. The first thing we found was something called inherent motivation. When we asked those team captains, to rank order, we asked them to rank order some leadership competencies in terms of their personal strength. Their number one strength was motivating. That was, that was what they were all about, because if you're, if you're leading someone around a rubber track, you have to motivate them to want to do that. But when we asked those parachute team leaders the same thing, it was a complete reversal. Motivating was second from the bottom of a list of nine. And as it turns out, the reason that's true is that when people are in crisis, they're already upset, they are already spun up, they do not need a motivator. <laughs> you know, they need someone who brings the room down and kind of calms everybody. And, and our interviews of these, these in extremist leaders, and you can read about all this stuff in that book, but our, our interviews with them, 
revealed them to be very quiet professionals. They weren't boastful, they were very humble, they were quiet, and they tended to bring the room down. Hey, no big deal. You know, that's what, that's what people need. And at the end of the day, leadership is about giving people what they need. It's not about your style or, you know, your preference. It's about giving them what they need. So if the parachutists were not about motivating, what was their number one competency? It was learning. And these are experts. These, they have expert licenses. They're instructors. But in, in crisis, the, the people who are good at it and practiced at it are focused outward all the time. They're focused on the environment that in this case is trying to kill them. But even in a business context, the best crisis leaders are not fretting about, you know, what's going to happen to them or what's going to happen to their people. They're focused on the business environment. They're focused on the threat. And they're focused on things that are going to improve their position. And it's the same thing with these crisis leaders. They're focused outward all the time. And as it turns out, that's the best way to control emotions. If, you, if you're under some kind of threat or if people in your organization are angry or, or afraid and they're showing this emotionality, it's because they're not task focused. And we would never tell a cadet, you know, con try to control your fear or your emotions because that turns them inward and then it makes it worse. I mean, have you ever, have you ever told somebody who's upset, hey, get control of yourself? <laughs> it always goes badly, you know, because they focus inward. But if you focus people on a task, and I don't want to get too far into the neuropsychology, but it crowds out the ability to turn inward on yourself. And if you really focus on what you're doing, you're braver than you think. And you are also uh, less angry than you think. So in your own experience, when people are starting to frustrate you and the veins are starting to pop out, you're not task focused anymore. You know, you're kind of indulging in your own emotionality.